Web Marketing That Works podcast, episode 49. Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hi there, it's Toby Jenkins from the Web Marketing That Works podcast. This is the show for people who love marketing on the web and today we have a very special guest, Liz Wiseman. She's a top 10 global leadership thinker. She's an incredible author of the book Multipliers that Adam and I have really, well firstly we loved it and secondly we've applied a whole bunch of her thinking from Multipliers um, to our business over the years. It had an incredible impact and there's plenty of blog posts available on her Multipliers book that we've written. But also today, we're diving into her latest book, which is Rookie Smarts. And Rookie Smarts is actually subtitled, Why Learning Beats Knowing in the New Game of Work. And I felt like this was really applicable for a marketing audience, considering how quickly marketing is evolving and changing, and why these Rookie Smarts and her concept of trying to keep that beginner mindset is so important and applicable across all sorts of professions and industries And so I really hope you enjoy today's interview with Liz and look forward to hearing your feedback and comments. So as always, the show is brought to you by the bonus 33 free templates that come with our book. So you can jump on over to bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book to download those for free. And thank you so much for joining us. We might as well get started. So hi, everyone. I'm stoked to have Liz Wiseman on the show with me today. Adam and I discovered Liz's first book, Multipliers, on a trip to Bali and absolutely loved it. So now's not the time to go into that book, but if you run a business or manage people or aspire to manage people in any way, shape or form, then you definitely need to read Multipliers and I'll make sure I link to that in the show notes. Aside from writing, Liz also teaches leadership to executives around the world. She's the president of the Wiseman Group, leadership research and development firm in Silicon Valley in California. Liz has been listed on the Thinkers 50 ranking and named one of the top 10 leadership thinkers in the world. Some of her recent clients include Apple, Dubai Bank, Genentech, Nike, PayPal, Salesforce.com, and Twitter. So Liz, might I be so bold as to add Blue Wire Media to that list as well? Absolutely. And Blue Wire Media is really in the friends and family category. It's been so fun collaborating with you over the years. Oh, thanks, Liz. Yeah, we've loved and learned so much through books and the workshops and stuff that we've attended, as well as a few drinks and coffees with you. So thank you so much. And it's great to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm excited to share what I've been, you know, had my head uh, literally in a book for the last couple of years researching and writing. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about your latest project then, Liz, the new book, Rookie Smarts, with the subtitle, Why Learning Beats Knowing in the New Game of Work. Um, What drove you to write the book, Liz? Well, you know, Toby, the book began uh, actually with me on kind of a random rant. I had finished up the Project Multipliers, and I was meeting with my publisher, um, Hollis Heimbach at HarperCollins, and she wanted to talk with me about, you know, maybe an idea I had for my next book. And I I had an idea, and I went prepared to talk with her about that. But as we began our conversation, I went on one of those random rants. You know, we all have these, these kind of burning questions or these thoughts that just linger with us. And I told her that I've had this long kind of fascination with this idea that we're so often at our best when we're doing something for the very first time. And, you know, why is it that sometimes not knowing how to do something is more um, advantageous than knowing how to do something? And, and as I'm ranting about this, you know, Hollis is breaking out into a big smile. And, and she says, well, Liz, that is the book that I would like. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what we're here to talk about. Because, see, I had a plan. <laughs> and, this, and, and this wasn't my plan. And it wasn't that it was off topic. It was kind of maybe a, an element of it. But she said, that's really the question I'd like you to go answer. And I think in writing this book, one of the things I learned about myself is I tend to write books not where I have expertise. I write books where I don't have a lot of expertise, but where I have a lot of curiosity and passion for something. And this is one of them. Um, I just was really determined to try to figure out why being new and inexperienced can be an advantage. And I think the book really explores that and looks at why being a rookie, you know, and by that, I mean, being new to something 
hard and important. You know, whether you're young or whether you've got years and years of experience, why when we're thrust into these rookie situations, does it tend to bring out our best thinking and our best work? And why is that important right now when the work environment is fairly volatile and changing fast and cycles are spinning fast? And so that's really what I explored. You know, becomes a guide for companies and individuals who really want to stay agile and relevant in a rapidly changing environment. So that's how we got to this point. Yeah, right. That's a great story. I'd be interested to hear what the idea was that was shelved in the end, but perhaps today is not the time for that. But, well, and uh, probably because honestly, Toby, I'm not sure I can even remember it because <laughs> once, you, <laughs> once you, you know, I got my marching orders from Hollis and, you know, once you spend a couple of years on a burning question like that, you kind of forget what was on the periphery of it. So honestly, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, right. And so how long has the research process and writing process been in terms of coming up with the new book that's due to launch in October, I believe? Yeah, I think I spent roughly a year doing the research and the research, what we did, and I I assembled a research team that helped me with the interviews and getting some geographic scale to some of this. But what we did is we looked at work tasks and it might be uh, building a software program, creating an app writing a training course, you know, writing a blog, what have you. We looked at how experienced people versus inexperienced people perform that same type of work. And we asked managers to kind of paint those scenarios for us and assess how an experienced person versus an experienced person did it, how they acted, how they thought about it, and how they performed. And then, you know, I think we looked at over 9,000 data points. It was 400 different work situations that we dug into, um, what I was able to do is then, you know, you know, through a lot of correlation analysis, look at how rookies tend to operate when they're at performing at their best versus how experienced people, you know, I call them veterans, tend to operate, you know, how the highest performing veterans operate, as well as how the low performing rookies and veterans operate. And, you know, I think what I found in this research is that the highest performing rookies and veterans operate in very, very different ways, both successful, but approaching their work in very different ways. And what I found is broadly across industries, experienced people tend to outperform rookies by a small margin. I was surprised at how small this margin is. However, when I cut that data in the knowledge industry, what I found is that rookies tend to outperform veterans. And in particular, they outperform them when the work is innovative in nature and when time to deliverable is critical. They tend to actually be faster, despite the fact that they have this huge learning curve and an often no network to draw on. They actually work in faster cycles and they tend to deliver faster. Right. Yeah, and then when I cut the data on the low performers, what I found, which was sort of equally shocking to me, was that both rookies and veterans tend to fail in the same ways. You know, they fall into the same kinds of traps, but they succeed in vastly different ways. And, you know, I came to call this way of working the way we tend to think and act. You know, when we're mindful of that we're doing something the very first time, I call it rookie smarts and kind of really try to decode this way of working. Yeah, well, I mean, do you see the rookie smarts, you know, this concept of the rookie smarts mindset, I guess? You know, do you see it as a leadership concept or do you see it as a more broadly applicable? I think it is broadly applicable. You know, I would not call Rookie Smarts a leadership book per se. It's really a book about a way of working inside of companies and that's applicable to people at all levels. However, there are some very significant implications for leaders in terms of how you manage your rookie talent and how you create a culture so that everyone in the company can be thinking and acting with rookie smarts. The idea behind that is that rookie smart is not a function of age, most certainly, and it's not even a function of experience. I saw this fantastic breed of rookies, these people who just were able to operate and think this way, who despite years of experience and success, And who had all the trappings that come with experience, they were able to maintain this kind of vibrant, youthful way of working. I came to call them perpetual rookies. You know, it's my aspiration to be a perpetual rookie. No, and I'm not talking about people who stay in this sort of naive, clueless state, because that would probably be fairly annoying. It's people who can toggle 
people who know when it's time to, to use your hard won experience and wisdom and when it's time to toggle over into your rookie mode where you can come at your work fresh and play a very different kind of a role and, and take a different mindset. And I think the leadership implications is how do you yourself maintain your rookie smarts and how do you keep your entire team or your enterprise operating kind of hungry and foolish, so to speak? Mm. Were there particular people that you saw in your research or that you felt sort of embody the mindset or was it a situational thing versus a person, you know, an individual personal trait? You know, it, I think there's function that comes from both. I think when you look at rookie smarts, I think it captures how we tend to operate when we're aware that we're new to something important and hard. It's very situational. You know, people often, oh, in fact, one of my pet peeves was from my friends who would say, oh, Liz, how's that book coming along? You know, that beginner's mind book. I mean, that was sure to get someone off my Christmas list, you know, <laughs> written out of the will. I joke with my friend, you are so off my friend list because it's not about having a beginner's mind. It's what happens to us when we're put in a fairly desperate situation. And, you know, and if you're on this podcast, I might ask you to do this as we're talking is like, and I mean, teleport yourself as in like Star Trek from the seventies kind of <laughs> look for yourself is, you know, to go back in place and time to when you were new to something and you know you might go back to when you were fresh out of university but you might just go back a couple months ago to when someone gave you a challenge that was just out of your comfort zone out of your knowledge zone where you face this huge knowledge or skill gap and you might think about what did you do in that situation how did you think about your work what did you do what did you not do who did you seek out how did you stay on track how did you know you were doing a good job you know who did you go talk to because what we find is that situation in and of itself prompts us to go do a certain thing. You know, it's not that we bring new ideas. It's actually that we bring kind of no ideas. And when you don't really know what you're doing, you're forced to seek help. You're outward oriented. And we found that inexperienced people on average seek out five experts when they face something new. Whereas experienced people, it's kind of like one point something, something and change. The lack of knowing forces us outward. It also forces us to operate in these kind of agile lean cycles. We don't know what we're doing. So we're very cautious. We don't take these big leaps that we certainly don't take big heroic leaps. We operate in these very thin slices. It's like try something, get feedback because we want to prove ourselves, but we want to stay on track. And so we operate in a way that we would have to describe as sort of agile and lean. It's what a lot of companies are trying to get their workers. You know, we tend to improvise, we get scrappy, and it's the situation in and of itself that really prompts this, this way of working. Now, sometimes we're not mindful that we're doing something new and hard. And, and so we do really bumble those situations. But there is also a piece of it that's driven very much by, by who we are. And as I studied these, what I call perpetual rookies, I found that they shared several traits I and mean, characteristics, like kind of deep in who you are, not just skills and approach. And they tended to be curious intellectually curious, they tended to be humble, not necessarily meek, and certainly not lacking confidence, but a willingness to be taught by other people. They were playful in their work. They were deliberate in how they did it. They had these sort of what I would consider very childlike attributes, but yet this sort of adult attribute of sort of mindfulness and deliberateness about what they were doing. So I think you know, the situation itself prompts a lot of this way of thinking. But I think some of it is driven by, by who we are. Did you see ways of, for instance, I know, you know, in Multiplies, you talked a lot about sort of the behaviors and sort of that how you can transition your behavior to become a multiplier, for instance. And so did you see that same kind of pattern in Rookie Smarts where do you see it as a teachable mindset? You know, were there processes was that a part of your research as in components of how to get started in developing this concept for yourself? You know, absolutely. And that, I think it's what I'm always looking for because of what I do. You know, I teach leadership, you know, to managers and leaders around the world. And so I'm always looking for what in this package is teachable. But yeah, there's certain people who I think have a natural knack at this. And there are those of us who struggle. But yeah, you know, they're there's things that are teachable, but I would even take it further down to this. I think there's part of it that comes with like this mindset. And we can coach ourselves, we can coach others to be able to think and act in this mindset. 
And so what would you see is sort of that, what would you be coaching if we were to break it down into either the teachable bits or the coaching bits? What would you sort of suggest to someone, you know, if one of the listeners is keen to hear about how to do it, where would you start? Well, you know, the, the book has like 16 different experiments. Um, I did some of this with Mulch, but I took it much further in this book, breaking down to go try these little bite-sized things to help build this mindset. And um, I'll share one of you. And I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm sharing this please. one because it's, I don't know that it's necessarily my favorite starting point, but it's one of my absolute favorite stories from the book. And that just happens to be um, about an Australian surfer. And so, Toby, I have to tell you in advance, you're going to have to help me with the accent on this story. Because <laughs> we're going to get to a part of it, and I'm going to just go, okay, over to you. And, and, and so this is, all you have to do is basically speak. But so what, one of the, my favorite rookies and perpetual rookies that I met and studied is uh, Bob Hurley of Hurley Sports. So he's the founder of Hurley Sports. He started as a kid in a surf shop. And, um, you know, he's not, not particularly good with customers or buying the desk, but he was really good shaping boards. So he was a board surfer, uh, shaper. And he ended up building Hurley, um, you know, International, which is, you know, a global action sports brand. Uh, it's now owned by, by Nike, and Bob still runs it to this day. And, and as he built this company, it was case after case of Ricky Smarts, where he said, you know, I wanted to represent Billabong, an Australian surfwear company. He had no idea what it took to be a distributor. And, and he just approached, you know, the, the founder and CEO of Billabong. And he, case after case, where he needed to do something, he didn't know the right way to do it, but he just did it the simplest, most naive way. You know, ran out of you know, money. He had $3 million worth of orders, but no contract with, with Billabong. But he needed to produce these shorts. No one would give this young surfer alone. So he just kind of went to the head of the, the banking industry for the LA garment industry and just said, you know, I don't have a contract. Uh, you know, I don't have any collateral, but this is why I love what I do. And the guy, you know, just handed him a check for $200,000 so he could buy, you know, the, the raw materials to make that line, you know, that season's line of clothes. So case after case of rookie smarts as he built this company. And, and when I'm talking to him, I'm like, Bob, how do you maintain it? You know, Bob is very experienced now. He's been running this company for years. And, you know, and he's got some years uh, under his belt. And because he has this hopeful, youthful vibrancy of anything is possible. And he said, you know, I have my good days and I have my bad days. And on those bad days where I feel stuck in a rut, you know, sort of limited, unable to see anything new or beyond, he said, I remember an encounter I had with an Australian surfer. So this is back in, like, I think it's 1979. Bob is a young surfer on Huntington Beach, which is sort of surf capital USA. And he surfs with this group of elite surfers. And, you know, Bob's sort of on the outer edge, perhaps, of this clique. And Huntington Beach apparently is more clicky than a high school. Um <laughs> And there's the waves that the elite surfers, you know, and the professional uh, surfers are surfing. And then there's the waves that, you know, everyone else is relegated to. And there's a little bit of a, a system, a cast system on that. And Bob's out surfing with these pros and he loses his board out from under him. It goes under the Huntington Pier. It goes over to the other side of the pier in these lesser waves. And he sees Wayne Bartholomew, world champion surfer at the time, um, you know, referred to as Rabbit. And he sees him out there in these waves surfing with these kids. And, and he says to him, hey, like, dude, you're a legend. Come over and surf with us. Like the waves are righteous. You know, I, he probably said something like, oh, dude, I'm stoked to see you. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have really great surf talk. but That's good surf talk, Liz. Is that, is that decent? Um, well, I have an even worse uh, Australian accent. But the way that rabbit replied to him really struck him because rabbit said, okay, I'll give you your line. And then I need it in, in the, the true accent. He's like, <laughs> he's like, that's kind of you, mate, but I like surfing here with the kids. This is where I get my energy. They fuel me. Okay. Wow. You got to do it for me. <laughs> I like surfing with the kids. This is where I get my energy. Where, where, I, where they fuel me. Uh Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you miss that's kind of you, mate, but, that was shocking. Yeah. Well, and, and no so he, 
Okay. Well done though. Um, good on you. I should say, you know, and it's, he really declined this opportunity to go serve with these elite surfers because it was surfing with these amateurs that he kind of rekindled his own fire and love of surfing. And, and Bob always remembered that. And as the CEO of a successful and large company, you know, on those days, he said, when he gets stuck in a rut, he said, I grab my board, I go down to the beach. He doesn't go surf with the professionals, you know, many of whom are currently sponsored athletes. He said, I go find the kids and the amateurs and I let them renew me, renew my mind. And, you know, on days where he doesn't have time to surf, he said, I just walk down the hall and I go find the rookies in my own company, you know, the interns the new hires, the people who are brand new in assignment, and I just go spend time with them. Wow. And for me, it's one of the very simplest things that we can do is learn to see our work through the eyes of of true newcomers, uh, people who haven't yet formed patterns, you know, who are still in the question phase rather than the answer phase. So that was one of kind of my favorite ways to renew one's rookie smarts. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love that. <laughs> no, and there's concept. A- and so simple. I mean, in any profession as well, you know, there's there's always newbies. Yeah, go find the newbies and let their energy fuel you. And, and there's a whole bunch of ways that we can kind of hone these practices, these behaviors, and the mindsets. And like I said, the book is full of them. There's about other uh, sixteen of them. Uh, and I've got them all nice and bundled in the appendix, so they're kind of an easy little reference. But I'll tell you what, I still think those that's the hard way. Even the simplest things, it's the hard way. Willing ourselves to find our rookie smarts, I think is the hard way. I am more partial to the easy way. <laughs> I the, the, the la- too. Yeah, the lazy man way. And the lazy man way is is not to try to train our brains or to will ourselves. It's to just go put ourselves in situations where we don't know what we're doing. And and I tell you, you'll find your rookie smarts really fast. <laughs> like, you know, it's, um, oh, this is an interesting confession to share with a lot of people, but just last uh, week, I guess it was when Apple announced um, the, the new um, the iPhone 6 and the new Apple Watch and Apple, you know, the day before I get a email note from, you know, someone at Time Magazine asking if I'll write an article commenting on, you know, can an upstart company go up against Apple now that Apple's entering the wearables market? And I looked at that email note, and what they said is, can you comment on this about this particular company, about this particular CEO? And we need it. Um, so I got it at 4.30 in the afternoon. They said, we need it to have you um, write the, the piece by 10 a.m. tomorrow, listen to the Apple announcement live. Rewrite your article while they're announcing and have it to us by 10 a.m. And, you know, I looked at that and I thought, well, okay, first of all, that's a ridiculous timeline, but it's interesting. And I really don't know anything about the wearables market. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in tech, but I had no expertise in wearables. I didn't know anything about this company. And I looked at that and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to say yes to that. And so I said, yes. And it's amazing how fast you learn when you just sign up to do something hard that you don't quite know what to do. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that I would sign up to go, you know, perform brain surgery on someone. You know, I had a little bit of expertise and something to pivot from. But when we say yes to hard things, then we take jobs we're not qualified for and push ourselves into challenges we've never seen before. It's amazing how fast it brings back that way of working. Yeah. You know, I called up my buddies and, and you know who knew the wearables market. And I'm like, you know what? I've got to learn this really fast. Teach me what I need to know. <laughs> like I got, I got humble. You know, so I started operating in what I call hunter gatherer mode. You know, just out, out of the the tribe, out of the village, hunting for expertise to try to bring back to bear on the problem. Yeah. I think I think that's the easy way to do. It's the scary way. But I actually think it's the most effective way for us to maintain our agility, our relevance. Um, yeah. Do something that scares us every day, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the things that you've mentioned really, like to me, sort of tie back to multipliers as well, particularly the concept of intellectual curiosity. I remember you saying that that was out of all of the indicators of leadership, 
you know, multiplier leadership, that curiosity was one of the key sort of character traits. And I'm interested to see that, you know, rookie smarts by the sounds of things sounds very much as though that's almost the focus of this book is how do you stay curious? And, you know, I really think it is. And, you know, what's ironic is when I set out to do this project, I really wanted to leave multipliers in my past. And it is not because I am not full of love for multipliers. <laughs> it's that, you know, I don't I don't want to get comfortable. I don't want to see everything through that lens. So I really, um, in fact, some of my colleagues reviewed early versions of the manuscript and they kept saying, Liz, but this is, here's a multipliers issue here. And I'm like, I'm not taking the shots, you know, like I, I am going to treat this as a completely independent question and body of research and just be willing to come to very different conclusions. And what I found in the end, I had to swallow a little bit of my pride on this, is what I found in the end is that there are some things that um, are very much in reinforcement of this multipliers way of thinking and leading is when I looked at the kind of leadership people need when they are out on a limb in a rookie assignment doing something new and hard. And I kind of looked at the characteristics of those kind of leadership. It looks a lot like leaders who are multipliers, um, leaders who invite people to do something hard, but then give them some space to figure it out. Um, and, you know, in the end, I think it really is a, a drill down into intellectual curiosity and, and even more important, intellectual vitality. You know, how do you maintain a useful way of thinking and, and working? And I think, you know, you know, part of the research and doing the book, I spent a lot of time looking at what's happening in our work environment. You know, how do we need to work when the world around us is changing really fast, when we are experiencing a deluge of information? You know, information is doubling you know, every 18 months in, in medicine and biology, it doubles at a rate of every nine months. The amount of available information is doubling, which is allowing, uh, and, you know, we've got all these technology tools, some thank you to, to, to Blue Wire Media, of course, that allow us to have access to this information fast and, you know, where it's truly ubiquitous, which, of course, allows our work cycles to spin really fast. But this information that we're trying to process and make sense of doesn't, it doesn't sit still. You know, the things that we know years ago, you know, had a long shelf life and, and there's a very short shelf life on knowledge right now um, with knowledge obsolescence rates, you know, in the 30% annually. What I put together a few data points, if you work in uh, STEM, science, technology, or engineering, medicine, if you work in the sciences or technology, about 15% of what you know today is actually going to be relevant in five years. And yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit, it's a little bit frightening. And, 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 and here's, cause you know, I, I am not uh, young anymore. I'm not right out of college. I've got some years of experience. And one of the things that's really comforting is that rate of obsolescence is just as true for people right out of school as it is for those of us who have been in the workforce for a while. But, you know, in this world of work, you know, knowing isn't valuable for very long. And, and really the critical skill in this environment is not what you know, it's how fast you can learn. Wow. Well, that's a pretty powerful point to finish on there, Liz. I love that. Now, Tom, before we finish, can yeah. I ask you to just maybe share one of your rookie experiences? You and I, you and Adam and I spoke as I was putting together this book, and you told me about starting Blue Wire Media and this sort of scrappy way of working as you just improvised and <laughs> figured it out and built this company. And I think it just really embodies one of these um, these kind of rookie smart modes. I call it the pioneer mode. It's like you know, relentlessly pursuing something. And uh, maybe you can share just a few observations from your own story. I, I would love to end on that. Oh, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, look, I mean, to me, Adam and I constantly joke. We actually made a joke yesterday, rookie smarts, you know, underline rookie, cross out smarts, and you'd have us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're killing me with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we, you know, for instance, even this podcast, you know, we launched it, perhaps three or four months ago, really with no idea as to how to do it. 
we would have reached out. We well, for one, we listened to a whole ton of podcasts. Two, we went and researched who we were going to, you know, who we felt was doing it really well, who we could emulate as much as anything, and then we followed their lead. You know, where do you learn the structure from? What tools do you need? How are we going to do this? And then, you know, at the moment, like literally last night, we're looking at getting a podcast editor involved as well. And, you know, after nine and a half years of business, um, we still feel like we're rookies. And, and, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, what instructions do we need to hand out, you know, to be able to hand over the editing process to an editor? Um you know, and banging those out and without trying to constrain them too much, what are the raw elements that they need to get it done? What other information do we need to supply so then they can do their job well and without having to come back to us and hand it over to them as a, as a project? And I mean, even that, you know, Ads and I were sort of having a laugh about how we often, we do our best work, you know, there's sort of get, you get this sort of tension, I guess, between us because we bounce these ideas around and we're trying to refine it and refine it and refine it constantly and we realise that you know often the tension in the work and us sort of disagreeing or trying to clarify um, even the terms that we're using you know what's tags you know what is a podcast tag is different depending on what program you use as an example so you know we have this tension of trying to figure it out we clarify it for ourselves and therefore we can help to provide instruction for others to bring this podcast editor on. I mean, you know, to, to me, that rookie piece doesn't ever seem to go away and it's often where we're doing our best work is where that tension is and where we don't know and, you know, what do other people think and what do other people say and do and who can we learn from to, you know, fast well, track I, our learning here. So I think that that really captures this rookie smart, the spirit of rookie smart. It's, how we tend to think, we tend to be inquisitive. We tend to you know, seek out, we operate in these fast cycles. We operate in these very hungry, agile ways. And, and we don't do it out of nobility. We do it out of desperation. And I think it's the most powerful <laughs> of learning. It's, and, it is. You know, it's, it's that state of tension. Like all the great work I've ever done, I've done because I said yes to something before I fully knew how to do it. And it is in that tension you know, facing a really steep learning curve that we tend to do our very best. It's counterintuitive. We think we do our best when we're experienced, but it's in that state of tension that not only do we do our best work, I'll tell you the, the, the final thing that I think I've learned in this research is that not only does this state of inexperience or naive cluelessness prompt our best thinking, our best work, it actually is the place where we experience our greatest satisfaction in our work. It's it's in these fast cycles, this hungry mode of learning that we feel our greatest joy. Um, I hear people say, you know, when they're thinking back, you know, having teleported themselves, if you will, because I want to be a rookie again. I felt the most alive then. And I think that's my a- ambition with this book is that people see that there's more talent there in our rookie staff and there's more capability in all of us when we put ourselves in our rookie zone, but it's also where we're going to feel the most alive and, and just love the work that we do. Mm. I mean, again, you know, just from that example, you know, last night as we were going through it said to ads, Oh, geez, I I can stay up all night hammering this stuff out, but we didn't. But, you know, that is definitely the energy that I feel, you know, when, when you are in that unknown zone, really. Mm, absolutely. Mm. No. I like it, the unknown zone. <laughs> Where were you when I was naming the book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Probably being a rookie, I think. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh, well, that's great, Liz. And thank you so much for, you know, joining us again today. I guess one thing that we ask all our guests is, you know, who do you learn from? in person, via books, blogs, and presentations. And I guess that's the other thing to me. Um, It was interesting you were talking about how people reach out for expertise. There's so much free information available. You know, identifying what you need or what you might need gives you such a starting point. There's so much information available online and everything that, you know, you can get access to thinkers and, you know, absolutely top-of-the-game people 
not necessarily in person, but you know, via books and blogs and presentations that you can see online. It's an incredible age to be able to do that and to reach out and find all that information, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if I had to offer just a little insight there, it's actually one of these rookie smart experience experiments. I call it talk to strangers. And we often tend to, to seek out, even when we're noble and we sort of go out and we seek out expertise, we tend to seek out like-minded people. It's just very natural to, us, to go seek out people who we're going to like understand what they're saying and kind of be able to interpret that. And I think one of the ways to get that rookie smarts going again is to go talk to strangers, um, open up your news feeds. Um, if you maybe read a very liberal newspaper, you know, stop for a month and just go read a conservative one, change your, your news sports, go add friends into your news stream that see the world very differently than you. And that's, you know, getting out of this echo chamber where our technology has allowed us to configure our news feeds and our information sources to verify what we think we already know. I think we need to break out of this and go talk to people who are going to have very different points of view. Go talk to strangers. That's why I'm trying to spend more time opening up and getting very, very divergent points of view. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. And so, Liz, where can people actually get the book? Or will be available 12th of October, did you say, earlier? It's available the 14th of October, and... It's available, I think it's going to be available in uh, bookstores and no throughout the U.S. I don't know how long it's going to be before books are physically um, available in stores in Australia, but it should be available simultaneously, you know, at um, e-retailers like barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, CEO Read, et cetera. And the e-book should be available then. And I believe the audio book is um, going to be available. I, I narrated that. It was actually a lot of fun can't say that I did a good job on that um, Australian accent, but uh, <laughs> good on you. That, that should be available simultaneously as well. Oh, and awesome. you can you can find any of that if you go to our website. It's uh, very predictably rookiesmarts.com. Great. Okay. And um, how can listeners connect with you? I, I am at Liz Wiseman on Twitter. Um, uh, on Facebook, I'm pretty easy to find. Liz Wiseman, LinkedIn. And um, we've got our website, thewisemangroup.com, and someone can always give a shout out there to um, info at thewisemangroup.com or to me personally, Liz at thewisemangroup.com. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Well, we'll make sure all of that stuff's in the show notes for people to find all those links. But Liz, thanks again for joining us and really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. So that wraps up the interview with Liz. So thank you so much, and I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. The key takeaway for me was the idea that putting yourself back into those rookie situations will actually help to keep your beginner's mindset and that rookie smarts mindset that Liz was talking about in order to really push yourself to learn more, to have that great sense of satisfaction of doing potentially something for the first time. And also that don't be afraid of not having the experience, I guess, was the other piece that I really felt she emphasized in that interview. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to shoot me any feedback if you've got any. My email address is toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au or I am available on Twitter at toby underscore Jenkins is my Twitter handle. Now the show, as always, is brought to you Buy our bonus 33 free templates that go with the Web Marketing That Works book and you can grab those from www.bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave a review on iTunes and enormously appreciate that. Thank you. So thanks so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.